Okay. Might have a few more people joining us, but we'll go ahead and get started here. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We we'll do our evening prayers. Glory to you, O God, glory to you, heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art in all places and fillest all things, the treasury of good things and giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls, O good one. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, have mercy on us, or cleanse us from our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities. Holy God, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. O Lord, our God, if during this day we have sinned, whether in word, deed, or thought, forgive us all, for thou art a good God who loves mankind. Grant us peaceful and undisturbed sleep, and deliver us from all influence and temptation of the evil one. Raise us up again at the proper time, that we may glorify thee, for thou art blessed with thy only begotten Son, and thy Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O most glorious ever virgin, blessed thea tokos, present our prayer to thy Son, our God, and intercede with him that through thee he may save our souls. The Father is my hope, the Son is my refuge, the Holy Spirit is my protection, O Holy Trinity, glory to thee. In thee, O Mother of God, I place all my hope. Rejoice, O Virgin Theotokos, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, for thou hast borne the Savior of our souls. Amen. Okay. So, let's see. I've got one more bring in here. So, uh, last week, we talked about the beginning of the divine liturgy, which is called the Liturgy of the Catechumens. And as, as I mentioned, it's the time for, for prayer. Uh, for for us and for the whole world, it's a time for uh, the uh, some of the prayers being expressed in, in hymnography, and that reinforces for us what we believe, and it teaches those who are learning. So so it's a time for those who are catechumens, and and really in present day even inquirers, right, who aren't even catechumens yet, to learn how to pray by praying and to learn the theology of the church through through singing it. And it's a time to hear the epistle and to hear the gospel. I mentioned that when uh, one becomes a reader, traditionally it would be a, a tonsured reader that would read the epistle. Uh, although at St. George and other places, we often don't just have a reader reading the epistle. We often have like for youth month, we'll have the youth or ladies altar society, or, you know, other times other people reading the epistle, but the reader reads the the uh the gospel the the scripture daily he's he is um you know given the charge and the encouragement to read the scripture to peruse the scripture daily so that those who hear it will be edified so it's not just about him being edified anymore but it's through that reading and uh and and also i've probably mentioned this before but the Church teaches us, right, even, even how to learn, and it shapes the, the mind of the heart, the phronema, the, the, the you know, mind of the heart, which, which shapes the mindset of the rational brain, right? So I mentioned before, sometimes in, in America especially, people will say, you know, they, they, want, they want to have a book because we're always like, you know, we're very, we're very book-oriented, and they're like, well, I need a book because I'm, I'm, I'm visually, you know, I'm a visual learner. But the visual learning is supposed to come not from the book, but like watching what's happening in the liturgy, right? That's the, that, that's the visual part. So uh, typically in Orthodox churches, you don't see many people have books. I mean, it's, but, you know, sometimes newer people will, uh, or some people will have the variables. I mean, that's, that's fine too. Uh, but it, it, 
even if we're visual learners, it, we're taught to listen, right? The, we listen to the epistle and we listen to the gospel as it is proclaimed, right? And that, and that precedes the, the homily. So that, that's the liturgy of the catechumens, as I said, traditionally, at least in sometimes and places, uh, maybe still, and sometimes uh, some places, uh, the, the catech catechumens are dismissed. And the idea of, of them being dismissed were that they would go and they would actually learn uh, the faith. They would be trained during the time of the next section, which is the heart of the liturgy and really the heart of Christian worship called the liturgy of the faithful. So I want to talk about the liturgy of the faithful. Uh, but before I go into the Liturgy of the Faithful, I want to talk about something else. So let me share my screen here with you. Okay, let me find where I am going. Okay, here we go. I think we were about here. So this is talked about the daily cycle a little bit. And uh, this again is the liturgy of the catechumens we talked about, also called the liturgy of the word. We call that as well. And uh, again, you know, Eastern liturgies and Western liturgies uh, have this distinction between liturgy of the catechumens and liturgy of uh, of the faithful so it it's it's really that uh there are a lot of similarities between the east and the west as many differences as there were uh between say the the old uh pre-schism roman mass uh and the and the eastern liturgies there are, are a great number of similarities especially in the way that the, the format of the service so we may go over that maybe a little bit later okay so uh my voice is echoing, huh? Everybody hearing an echoing voice here? Okay, okay. Not everybody's hearing an echoing voice. Some of you are. Well, we won't, hmm, I don't know. Let me see, you know, if you're using a cell phone, you might wanna try calling back in. I don't know if you're using a cell phone or not, but I know my cell phone sometimes um, echoes for reasons I do not understand on some calls, uh, but, uh, I apologize if if some of you are hearing that. Um, <clears throat> so the liturgy of the catechumens, as I said before, we have um, we start. Blessed is the kingdom. We have the great litany, and then the antiphon. As I said, we don't really do antiphonal singing very often, uh, with two choirs, one on one side and one on the other side, during the paraclesis service. We've been doing, we have been doing during uh, the the recent fast. Uh, the men and women would alternate the chanter stand. So that's sort of antiphonal. But we sing these three antiphons through the intercession of the Theotokos, the Savior save us, uh, a hymn to Christ, and also acknowledging that uh, the Theotokos is, is praying for us, right? As With the saints, all the saints praying for us. And the little litany, and then save us, O Son of God, with that beautiful hymn, only begotten Son and Word of God who art immortal, right? Just beautiful hymn. Uh, and then the little uh, litany, and then uh, the little entrance, which has these variable hymns, really the most, uh, it, with, with the readings, really probably the most variable part of the service is that little part when we come out with the gospel, uh, called the little entrance, the, the troparian, the song, the, and the Kentucky, and the songs for that particular day, uh, and sometimes the season are, are sung. And then um, there is the uh trisagian hymn the thrice holy hymn and i apologize last time this slide did not have the um did not have i didn't put that in the slide the thrice holy hymn which is pretty pretty big for us uh because that that's also something that is common to liturgies in the east and the west in the west it's called the sanctus but holy 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 and we we sing holy god holy mighty holy immortal the it's and and we regard that as 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 trinitarian right to the father son holy spirit and it reflects the hymn that is in the old testament and in the new testament it's it's that when whenever we see angelic worship that is this song this song that is this constant uh never ending 
uh, worship of heaven that we are participating in. Remember, we're not just symbolically acting it out. We're participating in heavenly worship. So the priest prays that despite our sinfulness, that God will accept this prayer, which is the prayer of the angels, right? Uh, this, this hymn uh, from us. And as I said, as a priest, we're praying for everyone singing the hymn, but uh, the priests are also praying for themselves in this um, prayer of the Trisagion. And there's this uh, sensing, as I said, uh, the sensing represents several things. It's the prayers rising to God. We see this in the Old Testament. We say this, the psalm or sing the psalm about the prayers rising to God. We see this in the book of Revelation as well, the, the angel with the incense and the prayers of the saints uh, rising to God. It also reminds us of the presence of God in the Old Testament. I mean, God would appear as fire and cloud and smoke, right? Like on Mount Sinai. So it reminds us of God's presence with us. And uh, it is, it's an offering to God because we bless the incense as an, as an offering to God. Um, so it's like a, it gives our prayer physicality in that sense. And then uh, it, also we, we sense as purification, sort of like the way we use holy water in the Old Testament, the way blood was sprinkled for purification. Incense is that, right? It's, it's, it's dedicated to God, it's sanctified. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it also it gives us the sense of God's, uh, reminds us of God's presence being with us. Uh, and th and this being being heavenly, right? And something important going on. So uh, so this altar is sensed during the the thrice holy hymn. We'll talk about sensing a little more. And uh, reading the epistle and the gospel and the homily. So that is the liturgy of the catechumens. And what I want to talk about before we get to the liturgy of the faithful is a service that goes on before the liturgy begins. And this is often uh, completed before uh, morning prayer, like or, you know, orthros or matins, which is morning prayer we do on Sunday before the liturgy. If there's no orthros or matins, then it's done just before the liturgy. Uh, at at St. George and other churches, if you have a lot of clergy, if you have multiple priests, then you can do the service during Orthros and Matin. So some people complete it early, but it and and, and at St. George we kind of finish the service, we close the service uh, a little bit before liturgy begins. So what we begin with is is a a loaf of bread, and this is a loaf of bread. This is the uh, the bread that we begin with as a particular recipe that is used. Uh, in order to make very simple leavened bread. Remember, we, we use leavened bread because of the resurrection, right? The, the uh, unleavened bread is regarded as, as dead bread. And, and uh, we use uh, leavened bread to remind us of, of life uh, using yeast. And uh, in, in the Western Rite, by the way, in the Orthodox Western Rite, the uh, the bread is very flat, it's very small, and they're wafer thin, but they also have leaven. It, it is leavened bread. It's just uh, pressed flat because leaven is required uh, for us. And uh, we begin with this. We begin with bread, a loaf of bread, and we begin also with wine. And, you know, bread, we take those things uh, like wheat and water you know, that come from from uh god that god has provided for us we put those things together with our our energy our our labor and we make a loaf of bread right and that's our offering right that's the prospera right that's the offering and also wine wine is is uh taken from grapes that god provides and we use our energy and we make something so uh ideally you know the prospera especially is offered uh by people within the congregation in in large churches often uh like saint george ladies altar society bakes enormous quantities of bread we use uh a lot of bread every sunday actually uh, only one of them for the main loaf but uh, you know the idea is especially at a smaller church that families will bring those uh will bake that bread 
right? And they will bake the bread and they will uh, bring it with, with a list of people who are living and, and departed that they would like uh, commemorated during the service. I mean, this so families have the opportunity to give that that offering. In large parishes, sometimes a donation will be given to the church because the bread is already done, you know, because, you know, then that's, and that's, that's fine too. Um, but this is an offering, right? And in the old days, it was a time when the bread and wine were really prepared in a different part in a different building, actually, next to the church, part of the church uh, complex or church campus, if we use, that's, that's a popular term for the churches as campuses. Um, I, actually, our, our, church in austin does that they have they have two campuses they have a central campus uh and a a northern campus so uh you know the, we take this this bread and this wine it used to be in a separate building people would probably you know you might have had a lot of people bring it and the priests had to kind of pick the best we still sort of do that if there are multiple loaves because we want to see the seal what's really important is that seal in the middle and and often uh you know it will look like the icons. You know, the icons say I C and X C, which is actually, you know, Greek letters, uh, Isu Sigma, Christos Sigma, uh, or Chi Sigma. I mean, and it means Jesus Christ, right? And Nika, in what looks like an N I K A, as we would transliter transliterate it in English, is conquered. So this seal says Jesus Christ conquers, right? And in in uh, in Greek letters, I think it actually had to do with. Um, with chiseling letters in in uh, in stone, but don't quote me on that. But you have a couple of different ways of doing the uh, the S. Either it looks like a C, or it looks like this letter here that looks more like an E, right? So, interestingly enough, you know, if you see a Greek festival, you will sometimes see like G R and then these two letters and then K to to make Greek. But these are actually S's. They're not they're not E's, but in English, it works for marketing purposes. So this is, uh, whether it's just, the sigma is, it looks like an E or it looks like a C, it doesn't matter. It's the same letter. Um, Jesus Christos Nika and Jesus Christ conquers, right? That's what it means. And uh, this is the, is, is the central seal is what we call, uh, what will become the, the lamb. And uh, that central seal is what is, is consecrated. Uh, on the holy altar and then to the left of that you'll see a triangle and to the right you'll see uh you know nine little tri small triangles and those uh the one on the left is a uh represents the the uh, Theotokos, the mother of god and those that are on the right represent various ranks of saints women saints unmercenary physicians you know and so and so on so um and then we also take uh triangles out of the a portion out of the bread for the living on the part so when we do this uh service we have uh, the side table the prothesis table and uh, on it is prepared the uh the loaf of bread and uh and and the wine that's there and some some water as well and um we have the what's called the discos the discos is you know the the plate it's on a little stand so it's elevated and a little plate and then uh the chalice and we begin this service and from the very beginning of the service you can get a sense of the theology of the divine liturgy so i want to read this very th first thing that is said actually as sort of like you know often this will be sort of like covered up right and and uh when 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 we we're done with the previous liturgy and everything is clean it's all covered and now we're kind of uncovering it and and doing the service again mm -hmm. uh make ready O bethlehem for eden hath been opened for all prepare a for the tree of life has blossomed forth in the cave from the virgin for her womb did appear as a spiritual paradise in which is planted the divine plant where of eating we shall live and not die as Adam. Christ will be born raising the image that fell of old. You might recognize that from Christmas, right? So here we have the virgin who's a spiritual paradise in which is planted the divine plant, right? Where eating of it, we shall live and not die as Adam. 
And then we go on, thou hast redeemed us from the curse of the law by thy precious blood, nailed to the cross and pierced by the spear that was poured forth immortality upon mankind or our Savior, glory to thee. So that is how we really begin before we started anything. And the priest takes the bread, makes the sign of the cross, and then essentially while uh, quoting the Psalms, he will uh, cut out the lamb in a, in a, uh, pers with prescribed incisions in a particular order, he will make uh, the incisions. And what's interesting, the way the text is written, this is kind of interesting, is that it's that um, when it when it says to cut to the the um, the right of the lamb, you actually cut on your left because it's it's like Christ is looking at you. The bread is like looking at you. So it's interesting. Um, so you you cut out the lamb and then saying for his life was taken up from the earth, the lamb is lifted out, the central part with the seal on top. And then is put upside down, and then we recall, uh, we use words that that recall sacrifice, and it's recalling Christ's sacrifice, uh, just you know, destroying the devil, and uh, we make incisions. Uh, remember, the seal is now upside down. The seal is kind of we turn it for his life is taken up for the earth, but the seal it's sealed down on the, on this golden plate the discos and we make incisions not all the way through so it holds together the seal is holding it together but we make uh, a incision uh this way and we make an incision uh this way and, it, and it's really about christ's glory right and then we we turn it back seal up and the priest will say and one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and once they came out blood and water he who saw it had borne witness and his witness and true is true right this is this is from the gospel and when we say that, we take the knife, it's a pointy knife that we use for cutting, uh, for doing all of this, and we, we pierce that, that I-S, that Yusu Sigma portion right there, that Jesus, that's what that means, right? Uh, that, that little corner, we pierce it uh, as, because of the piercing of Christ's side. So what this is about really is it's reminding us of Christ's sacrifice. Remember, Christ is not re-sacrificed. I think that might have been an idea that came in the West after the schism, uh, an idea of kind of the, you know, the the mass being a re-sacrifice of Christ. And I don't know enough about that to even talk about it, but that's certainly not true for us, right? Um, there is one sacrifice once for all, right? This is this is reflecting Hebrews. And we are taking this bread because what is what does God require from us now? Ever since he said, this is my body, right? Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. What, what God requires as a sacrifice is an unbloody sacrifice because he ended all of the sacrifices by his own sacrifice. He took his own blood and offered it, not in an earthly tabernacle, but the heavenly tabernacle once for all. The only blood that can really take away sins and purify and, and sanctify and give immortality. All right, and we have this this bread here that represents Christ, and we're reminding ourselves of what Christ has done for us of that sacrifice we're going to participate in. And after after the lamb is completed, then we we take a, a that small portion for the mother of God, and we put it to to the right side, um, because you know the the uh, the queen stood at thy right hand, right, arrayed in a vesture interwoven with gold, adorned in varied colors. We we, we uh, recall that verse. And uh, we take the, again, those little little triangles uh, on, on the right side there, and we put them down commemorating the saints. And then we, again, we have, we have a piece for the living and the departed. And uh, the priest then will pray for those uh, that he wishes to pray for, the living first and then the departed. Um, and he'll put little crumbs down. So if any, if a priest ever says, you know, you're something like you're a crumb on his plate or in the discos, that's what he means is that we physically put down a little, uh, for Orthodox, uh, Christians that we pray for, we, we put down a little crumb from this, this loaf on the discos that represents that you know, individual person. Right. So sometimes we have a lot, we have a lot of prayers, a lot of people that we're praying for on that discourse. And then at the end of uh, all of our prayers, then uh, incense will be brought over and we bless the incense and we, we take the, these little covers that go on 
the bread. The first thing is there's a little bracket. It's metal and it folds flat, but it's sort of like kind of this shape, like a C, you know, and there are two of them. So it's like a bracket that goes over the bread. And that represents the star of Bethlehem. So we sense that and put that on there. Uh, and saying a star came to rest where the young child was. And then we take uh, the little vestments, the covers, we cover the bread, we cover the chalice, and then we have the air, the large one, and we sense it and we cover all of that up and then we do our final prayers and that's done so i wanted to mention that because when we start the liturgy i mentioned before i think the the, the bread and the wine has been prepared and when we say uh when we pierce that seal that i mentioned with the spear and once they came up blood and water uh that's also not only to pierce the seal but that's when we put a little bit of wine and water in the chalice and then we put more wine in the chalice um as well so the chalice is ready and covered and and the bread is ready and covered by the time we start the divine liturgy and i want to mention that because we're going to go retrieve these things right a little bit a little bit later okay so let's go liturgy of faithful you know the the liturgy of faithful um is like i said the really the heart of the liturgy and the heart of christian worship and it's 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 the the uh Part of the service, remember that, that the, the catechumens are gone and only the faithful remain and the faithful, if we did all the litanies, um, we pray for the catechumens and then the faithful pray for themselves. And then we have this beautiful service or this beautiful hymn, the Cherubic hymn. And, and, and the Cherubic hymn that the people are singing uh, is... Um, this this you know joining again in the angelic worship and it's reflecting what the priest is praying as well you know and i love the beginning of this the beginning of this prayer no one who is bound with the desires and pleasures of the flesh is worthy to approach or to draw nigh to serve the O king of glory for to serve thee is a great and fearful thing even to the heavenly powers right but we recall um that christ became one of us became our high priest and has called us to make this uh unbloody sacrifice this bloodless sacrifice right and this is the one who is on the throne of the cherubim and the lord of the seraphim right so we ask god the priest asks god to look down upon him a sinner right and to cleanse him uh so that he is able to perform. Again, going back to the Old Testament, this is more explicit, right? The cherubic hymn, the priest will think of himself. But here, this is an explicit prayer. Uh, the priest recognizing his own sin, right? We, we must serve in, in, uh, in humility. And, uh, and this is a beautiful prayer for the priest. And then the priest says the cherubic prayer. Right, we uh, of a mystic supper, O Son of God, accept me today as a communicant, for I will not. I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, I'm reading it, and I'm like, wait, that's not right. Let us, a mystic, represent the cherubim and sing to the thrice holy, the life giving Trinity. Now lay aside our earthly care, that we may receive the King of all, who comes invisibly, escorted by the angelic hosts. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So the priest says that, standing first uh, to the east with his arms up, and then it turns. Uh, to the side and then turn to the side again and says it and it's my understanding actually that this this movement of holding the hands up and turning this way and turning this way is actually particular to antioch because it comes from the old syriac liturgy that we did before we did the liturgy of saint john chrysostom it's kind of like a holdover from that so uh, i don't think every everybody does that uh when they do the true bikim and there is some difference what i what i accidentally read there was the way that we pray that on Holy Thursday, during Holy Week, when we are commemorating uh, the mystical supper, it's called the Last Supper in the West. We we do that prayer that we do, you know, before a communion of the mystic supper, of Son of God, accept me today as a communicant. Uh, and when we do the liturgy of Saint um, Basil on Holy Saturday, this is what we say. So remember, there's we normally do this liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom. There's some difference between the liturgy of saint john chrysostom and the liturgy of saint basil they're almost identical except for the priest prayers and a few other differences but this is what we say during the liturgy of saint basil on on holy saturday the day before pascha 
We celebrate Pascha that night, actually. Let all mortal flesh keep silent and stand with fear and trembling and ponder nothing worldly within itself. For the King of kings and the Lord of lords cometh forth to be slain and given as food to the faithful. Before him come the choirs of the angels and all principalities and authorities. The many eyed cherubim, the six winged seraphim, covering their faces and crying aloud the hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Isn't that beautiful? We do that uh, liturgy of St. Basil uh, during certain times of the year as well. And this is, again, this is for um, very particular to Holy Saturday when we do that, uh, that hymn. It's really, really beautiful. That's when we commemorate Christ being in the tomb, uh, his body being in the tomb, and he descends into Hades and proclaims the resurrection. And then that night we uh, celebrate the, the, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, so the, the priest will do the trubic prayer, and then he does the sensing. Again, I've explained what sensing is. Um, and this is the great sensing, which is all, all the sides of the altar are sensed, that, that table with the bread and wine prepared is sensed. The, the high place, which is to, directly to the east, is sensed. That used to be, remember, the traditional place for the bishop uh, to sit. <clears throat> and then the, the priest comes out and he, he senses the iconography of the iconostasis, senses toward the west, he senses the people, senses the icon of Christ and, and, his, and his mother again. And then comes in and senses the front of the altar, the proscomity table in the high place once again, and then senses the people in the altar. So um, that's the great sensing. During some some sensings and some services, the priest goes down the aisle and comes back up. But in this in this service, he stands there on on the anvil on right on that raised platform where the where the doors are, and does that sensing. And when he's sensing, uh, he says uh, on Sundays. Uh, most of the time, he will say, come, let us worship and fall down before uh, Christ, our King. Or, come, let us worship and fall down before, um, or, come, let us worship and fall down before God, our King. Or, come, let us worship and fall down before Christ, our King, our God. Or, come, let us worship and fall down before Christ, the very King, our God. So we, we will um, say those things um, normally, and then we'll go into Psalm 50 or 51, I think, depending on your on your uh the, the numbering and that is the hymn of repent of oh, the psalm of repentance as david you know have mercy on me O god according to their great mercy according to the multi tender mercy blot out my iniquity wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin right that's david's prayer of repentance and that's the priest praying for himself right the priest is praying for it for his own sin when he's saying that so he's really saying that privately even though you may hear it he's saying it privately uh, on sundays and during, especially during Pascha, in fact, during Pascha, Paschal season, we're celebrating the resurrection. We don't do Psalm 50 because uh, it's not a penitential season, right? We've gone through Lent. That's penitential. Uh, and we we say these words. And again, these are these are said traditionally on Sunday, too, before Psalm 50. In that we have beheld the resurrection of Christ. Let us worship the Holy Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. Thy cross do we adore, O Christ, and in the holy resurrection we praise and glorify. For thou art our God, we know none that besides thee we call upon thy name. O come, all ye faithful, let us adore Christ's holy resurrection. For lo, through the cross is joy, come into all the world. Ever blessing the Lord at us sing his resurrection, but in that he has endured the cross for us, he has destroyed death through death. And, and that's also said before liturgy, if you come to Orthros or Matins, uh, that is said by the priest after he reads the, the, the resurrectional gospel, and uh, he'll say... And that we behold the resurrection of Christ and then come out for people to kiss the gospel of Psalm 50. So it's a beautiful hymn of the resurrection. Remember, Sunday is always a day of resurrection. So we always um, have reference to the resurrection. So the priest uh, does this sensing and, um, and, and, and is praying for himself of uh, Psalm 50 and um, even even when he bows to the altar after he gives up the censer, he comes and he bows to the altar, and he's recalling you know the prodigal son and the publican, the, again sinners, um, as he goes to that side table. And he goes to the side table and takes off this you know the large piece of cloth called the air, and says, "Lift up your hands unto the holy uh, of holies and bless you the lord and he puts that around uh the deacon if you have a deacon the deacon will put it around him and then he gives the deacon the discos with the bread and then the priest takes up the chalice uh from the table saying god has gone up in jubilation the lord to the voice of the trumpet 
And then we begin what is called the great entrance. And the great entrance is from the side table through the door of St. Michael around the congregation and up to the front, to the holy doors, right? And these are, we're bringing the gifts. It's sort of this um, real sense of the gifts we have prepared. We are bringing them uh, to the to God now. We're bringing them to the holy altar. And uh, somebody asked once, like, why do you take the air, uh, you know, that, that cloth? Why do, you, why do you tie it around you? Why do we even do the great entrance, right? Uh, I mean, we can move it from the table just like directly over if we needed to. Uh, and and again, this is, has to do with historical development. And I have no idea, but it's it may be from when you had the bread and the wine in another building, right? And you needed to get the air to the church and you, you know, the cover, and you needed to get the bread and the wine of the church, maybe. But it also gives, gives us the sense of, uh, of symbolically of Christ coming into the midst of his people. And I say symbolically because it, it's, not, it's not consecrated yet, right? It's, these are the gifts we are offering uh, to God, right? But, and, and it's a sense also of, of uh, us all offering this to God, right? So we're really all making the offering. And the offering really, of course, is ourselves, right? We're, we, we have physicality to our worship, right? I mean, I talk about this part of the service as the heart of our worship, but when we talk about the heart of worship. The heart of worship is also, I mean, this is liturgically the heart of our worship, but it's all, the heart of our worship is actually our hearts, right? We have to have a pure heart. That's, the, that, that's made clear in, in Psalm 50. That's also made clear uh, in the Old Testament when when God you know tells the the uh, the Jews you know I like your your it's not a sweet smelling savor to me right I mean your your sacrifices smell terrible to me like you know and 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 what's the answer to that is is repentance right then we offer bullocks up on the altar after we repent so that's why we're always uh, do these prayers of repentance. Um, there are pre-communion prayers that we do, right? We're, we're called to reconcile ourselves with anybody uh, if we have a broken relationship, if we can can reconcile um, before we bring this this offering. And we bring in the rest of the people praying for, um, again, our metropolitan, our bishop, the, uh, the priesthood, first praying for all Orthodox Christians, right? And then our president and civil authorities. Right, we we remember them more explicitly in the liturgy. Later, we remember them, asking that we that they have peace and that in their tranquility we have peace. Right, when the when the government is at peace, sometimes that's better for the church. Right, in in our peace, um, and uh, and the priest will pray for particular people when he reaches those the bottom of the steps. There, you may notice he prays for the living and then he prays for the departed, and then. He ascends the stairs and takes these holy gifts to uh, the altar. If the deacon is there, the deacon takes the bread and the priest takes the chalice. And uh, as he goes up, he, he says, um, you know, the noble Joseph, when he had taken down that immaculate body from the tree, wrapped it in pure linen and spices and placed it in a new tomb. Right. And, uh, there are those words, you know, the tomb of the body and Hades of the soul is God and paradise of the thief and of the throne of the father who is thou Christ filling all things thyself uncircumscribed as life bearing is more splendid than paradise, more radiant than any royal chamber is shown forth thy tomb. O Christ, the fountain of our resurrection. Right? These, this is what the priest says um, as he ta takes the bread and wine, puts it on the altar and then he takes off the chalice and the bread covers and puts them to the side and takes that air and senses it because the deacon takes it off and holds it up for the priest to take, and he senses it and then puts it uh, over the chalice of the bread, that big cloth. Um, and by the way, a lot of times, if you if you have one priest, he does the deacon parts. Some some deacon parts are omitted, but a lot of the deacon parts are done just by the priest. If you don't have a deacon and you have especially multiple priests, the junior priest, which is typically the one that, whose ordination is soonest, will do the... Um, but would really do most of the things that the deacon would normally do. So now the bread and the wine are on the altar, and the priest completes. He does most of Psalm 50, but that part, do good, O Lord, in Zion, let the walls of Jerusalem be built. Then shall they be pleased with the sacrifice of righteous oblations and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they shall offer bullocks upon that altar. When the priest, the priest says that at the end, once they're on the altar and senses the altar. 
That's that. And there's also a, a part here where the priest uh, will ask for the, the other clergy to pray for him, right? Um, at the, and, and he says, may that same spirit serve with us all the days of our life. So there's this sort of uh, uh, the priest praying for each other, right? We pray for the people and, and the people should be praying for the priest, right? We all, we're always praying for each other. And then there's a uh, litany of supplication, another, another litany. And remember the priest, especially at this time, while the people are praying and being led in prayer by the deacon, the priest is doing uh, his prayers for, you know, for his part in the liturgy. Um, and we get to a certain part after the litany in which uh, I love this, you know, let us stand to right, let us stand with fear, let us attend that we may offer the holy oblation in peace. You know, there's this sense of, of let's, you know, we let's stand at attention, right? Um, and we actually say that. I think it comes across in the Greek more, you know. Uh, and I say, you know, Sophia Orthy, you know, sort of like stand at attention, like stand up, like we're in the presence of God, right? And this is serious. And uh, that's when we say, you know, let us lift up our hearts. And let us give thanks unto the Lord, you know, which also is something common in the East and the West. This, this uh, lifting up our hearts and giving thanks to the Lord is, is uh, part of the Eastern liturgy too. And then the priest goes through uh, th this beautiful prayer talking about uh, really recalling who God is in, a, in, a, in, in, in the deepest way. You know, God, ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing and eternally the same. You know, it's this beautiful Trinitarian prayer. I mean, who are we offering to? Right? This is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the most high God, the one who created all things. Everything that has existence has existence because he has given it existence. He is the only one, right? He's really the only existing one, right? Because he's the only one that exists by himself. Uh, but he gives life and existence to all things. And then there's a point. He's, he's talking about the 10,000 angels, the cherubim, the seraphim, six-winged, many-eyed, soaring aloft, borne on their wings. And then at that point, aloud, he says, and th this is continuing the prayer, right? So he talks about these beautiful angelic creatures. And then he says, what are they doing? Singing the triumphal hymn, shouting, proclaiming, and saying, right? And then you hear this little dinging sometimes, uh, you know, ding, 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 ding. What that is, is the, the deacon is taking the star the little metal piece that goes over the bread and he's sort of clanging it in the sign of a cross and then takes it off and puts and, and, the, and gives it to the priest. The priest kisses it because it has a cross on it and then puts it down. So uh, with that, this is this. And then this, then the priest is the, the choir singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of thy glory, right? So Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord of the, the, the heavenly armies, right? Um, and Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It's beautiful. Uh, the choir singing that. And then the, the priest continues with his prayer and eventually gets to the point where um, he recalls the words of Christ from the gospel, right? Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. And then uh, drink of this, all of you. This is my blood, you know? And interestingly, when he, when he recalls these words before the bread and the wine, the priest, um, Unlike in the West, when there are signs of the cross being made, the priest stands still. There, there are there are no actions by the priest. Uh, he's standing, just standing before the bread and the wine, before in the front of the altar, and saying these words. Um, and this is beautiful. All right, so we're getting ready to now do the the this the offering. It's the an elevation. We're lifting up the gifts, offering them to God. The deacon is there, the deacon does it, or the priest will do it if, if there's no deacon. But listen to this. <clears throat> um, and in the, 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 what is said during that offering, right? With the bread and wine on the altar, we're offering it to God as thine own of thine own, we offer unto thee in behalf of all and for all. You know, everything's God's, right? <laughs> Even this bread and wine's God's. And, but he has called us to make this offering, right? So we, we take what he has given us, we make something with it, this, this loaf and this wine, and we, uh, we're we offering it, you know, back to him and offering ourselves with it. That's the important thing, right? This is our gift. Our, our, our lives are our gift, but physically it is this bread and this wine. Thine own of thine own we offer unto thee in behalf of all and for all. And that's 
we have to realize, right? This is this is our offering for us. It's grace comes throughout all the world, right? We we make our churches are temples to the true and living God, the creator of heaven and earth, right? God of God, Lord of Lords. Every being that claims to be a God, he made it. Right? Those one, those ones that went bad, that do evil in the world, and 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 they set themselves up as gods. Their origin is found in the one that created them. He is above all things, no beginning. And uh, and we we that that's what our temples are are dedicated to. And uh, that's why we, you know, you might not see it here, but then the icon there of the mother of God with her hands upraised in that picture. Um, underneath it says, thou art more spacious than the heavens, right? Within her womb. Who is that one? The one that cannot be contained. It contains the whole universe within himself. All things contained within him. So, and and we offer, we we are, the priest is a priest of the most high God, right, of heaven and earth. And, and we are a holy priesthood together, right? The priesthood and the laity. And, and we are offering we are making offerings on behalf of the entire world. And, and who knows how much through our prayers, the universe is sustained by what we do. As bad as we think the world is, what would it be like if the church did not constantly call God's grace down upon it, right? And, and, a, and a world that has forgotten God, that denies God's existence or worships lesser beings as God, worship themselves, right? Despite all of that, we... On, on behalf of everyone is asking God to be forgiving and compassionate and loving, right? And, 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 and through this work and the work of, of evangelism and proclamation, we're calling, we're drawing all men to him, right? That's our, this is, this is our work. We need strength to do our work. So we need that grace within the church. So, but this, I'm going to read this. This is what is said before thine own of thy own. Think about this, right? This is heavenly worship we're doing. Having in remembrance, therefore, this saving commandment. And what is this commandment? This is Christ telling us to do this in remembrance of me, right? To take the bread. This is my body. Take the, the, the wine, right? This is my blood, right? So we're, this, this is, we, we are offering God what he commands us to offer. And Listen to this, having in remembrance, therefore, and, and we'll talk about this to having in remembrance, having in remembrance, therefore, this saving commandment that all those things which have come to pass for us, the cross, the grave, the third day resurrection, the ascension into heaven, the sitting at thy right hand, and the second and glorious coming, thine own of thine own, we offer unto thee in behalf of all and for all. And then the choir sings, we hymn thee, we bless thee, we give thanks unto thee, O Lord, and we pray unto thee, O our God. But think about this, right? We're remembering, right? The saving commandment and all those things which have come to pass for us across the grave, the 30 resurrection ascension to heaven, the sitting at that right hand. What else is, has already come to pass for us? The second and glory is coming. We're already experiencing the kingdom of heaven to come, right? We, we, are, we are commemorating the, come, the second coming of Jesus Christ as though it has already happened. Because we are in heaven right now. That will blow your mind. Right? This is, uh, so we're constantly rem remembering. This, this part, actually, is called the holy anaphora. The anaphora is this offering. And there's uh, this, this remembering is anamnesis. It's, it, it, is, it is a recalling of what God has done. Because we have to realize what's happening here in the liturgy. On the one hand, we are mystically present in heaven. And on the other hand, we are part of salvation history. And, he, and even if salvation history goes on for thousands or tens of thousands or millions of years, who knows how, how, how long God will wait. We are in the 11th hour, right? We, we are experiencing the eighth day. This is the fulfillment of history. And we are part of that fulfillment of history, right? So it's reminding us of what our history is, you know? And we read like Genesis, that's our story. And we're fulfilling what's happening in the beginning of Genesis. Right? We're really becoming true human beings, which is only possible by the experience of God's grace. And and to and to you know to become what is what you know, even what Adam failed to 
failed to achieve. So we have this, you know, again, this remembrance and this offering, and then comes uh, the epiclesis, which is the calling down of the Holy Spirit on the gifts. And that's when we ask God specifically to make this bread, his body, and to make this wine, his blood, and to change them by the Holy Spirit. One thing we do not do in the Orthodox Church, though, is we never, we never uh, define a point in which that change is made. And nor, nor, nor do we, like we don't say it's at that point, nor, nor do we say how that change happens, right? We don't use the concept of transubstantiation. Sometimes the Orthodox in the past have used the word transubstantiation, but we don't mean um, any particular philosophical concept about how it happens. It just means it, it changes. That's all it means when Orthodox people use it. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop sharing this. And part, part of the reason I'm stopping sharing this is because I, I see my time. Uh, so that, remember, that it's the, remember, it's the remembering um, of where we are in salvation history, that we're that fulfillment of salvation of history in Christ, that what we're doing here is fulfilling Old Testament worship. If you've been with us the whole time, I hope that you see uh, that connection, right, between Old Testament worship, even going back to Cain and Abel and the altar and Noah and the altar and then uh, the worship of Israel and, and how this is fulfilled in Christ, as, as Hebrew says, since he is our high priest, the, the only mediator between God and man because he's the God-man. Right, the perfect offerer as high priest and the perfect offering, and how we are just participating in what he's done. Right. I mean, the cross. And we think, you know, we live in a world where um, people want to talk about having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Right. And, and I mean, the most personal uh, aspect of that relationship for us is that. When, when Christ died upon the cross, he defeated death, and he made the cross the tree of life. And his body and blood became the fruit of the tree of life. And he reopened the gates of paradise so that we can take the medicine of immortality, which is himself. Right? He's the physician and the medicine. How, how much more personal do you get? Right? When you receive Christ, you receive the whole Christ. The whole Christ. We don't. Christ cannot be divided. And this this also is is we we talked about the prophet last week who had had the his lips touched with an altar with a, with a coal from the altar that that the uh, angelic power picked up with the tongs and touched his lips and purified his lips. Wow, what is that? When do we take that coal? That the the fire of divinity within us. That's powerful, right? So we make we make this, we, we remember what Christ instituting this for us. And th this is important too, because you know, uh, we can talk about this later about the development in, in the West. But uh, you know, for those of us who grew up outside of the Orthodox Church, many people have no concept of this continuity of worship. You know, they just they just don't. In fact, I have a book that's interesting. It's actually drawing parallels between Old Testament worship and ancient Chinese worship and, and, and how some of, some of the ancient uh, Chinese worship rituals parallel the, the Old Testament. When they were worshiping, especially sacrificing to the God of heaven, right? To Shangdi, the, the highest God, which, which later just became synonymous with heaven. Like the word Tian, which is heaven, is synonymous really um, with God, and uh, but they have no concept of how it not only you know of of how Old Testament worship is fulfilled in the New Testament, right? It continues on in the church, and people have this idea because they worship in a way that's like not very old at all, right? Uh, when we see churches that have no altar, right? There is no altar. Sometimes they call a kneeling room. When I was growing up, the kneeling realm was called the altar. And, and, and inst instead of an altar, you have either a podium for somebody to speak or you have a band, like a bunch of microphones, you know, and a drum. And, and people, well, they, they really don't understand this continuity and will justify things by saying, well, you know, 
Christ said, someday we'll worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, that, you know, that doesn't mean that, that all of a sudden the apostles after Pentecost, who were still going to the temple as long as it existed, right, are, are going to just like sit in a circle and sing Kumbaya, right? It's like, man, we're going to worship in spirit and truth, man. Like, what does that, what does that mean? Right? The, I mean, this, the worship of spirit and truth is the worship, still the worship, right? The one, the worship that God has handed to us, to his church, right, is uh, the worship in spirit and truth. Like, it's not like spirit and truth is like an emotional, emotional sort of sense, right? So how do we worship God? And people are like, I don't think God tells us how to worship. Well, he did. He does. It's been delivered to us from the apostles, right? He instituted this worship. He fulfilled in his priesthood. Uh, the Old Testament. And fulfillment doesn't mean you throw something away, right? It's not abolishment, it's fulfillment, right? So, so he fulfills the Old Testament worship. He institutes at the mystical supper, uh, the offering of the bread and the wine, which we still do, right? And, and let me read something for you. I'll put this up again. We got a few minutes here before, actually about a minute before I want to take questions, but so I don't know if you can see this. You might not even be able to see this, but this is Justin, the philosopher. I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger. So let me use my fingers. The problem with the touch screen. This is, I think, there we go. Okay. So I generally don't like to read to people, but I'm going to read this to you. Um, but because this, you know, Justin Martyr, may have been born right around the time that we think or something the apostle john who's the last of the apostles uh that he reposed right so we're talking about somebody um right in that time somebody justin he was a philosopher who was martyred so this is right after the period of the apostles he might have even overlapped uh the apostle john so he's explaining how christians worship like right there after the apostles. But we having, after we have thus washed, who has been convinced and has assented to our teaching, bring him to the place where those who are called brethren are assembled in order that we may offer hearty prayers in common for ourselves and for the baptized or illuminated person and for all others in every place that we may be counted worthy now that we have learned the truth by our works also to be found good citizens and keepers of the commandments so that we may be saved with an everlasting salvation, right? So he's talking about the, those who are washed, right? In the waters of baptism who have been brought into the church, right? Those who are baptized, we call them those who have been illuminated by the grace of the Holy Spirit. And not just know the truth, like with, you know, rationally, but, but know the truth with the heart. There is then brought to the president of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with the water and and who's the president there's the one who presides is the really the bishop uh primarily and the you know like i said when the priest is there it's because the bishop can't be there right when the, the really the fullness of the liturgy is when the bishop is there he's the one that presides uh, but in his absence a, a priest that is under his authority presides is, is normally the case in our parishes so uh the brethren bring bread and a cup of wine mixed with water which we still do and taking them give us praises and glory to the father of the universe through the name of the son and the holy ghost and offers thanks and considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things at our hands and when he has concluded the prayers and thanksgiving all the people present express their assent by saying amen right we this is still part of the liturgy uh, usually the clergy are the ones, because if there's singing going on during the consecration, the clergy say the amen. This word amen answers in the Hebrew language, uh, genito, or so be it. The, the Greek words did not uh, 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 translate over in this, uh, this formatting. Uh, and when the president has given thanks and all the people have expressed their assent, those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving has pronounced and to those who are absent they carry away a portion and and actually we still put also warm water into the chalice uh before it is taken out to the people when we continue with the liturgy we'll talk about that 
a little more, but the mixing of the wine and water is, is, uh, is still practiced. And, and often if uh, people cannot, uh, come to the liturgy, uh, for a, like a, a, le- you know, legitimate reason, then, uh, they can be taken, um, Holy communion. Uh, typically this is done in practicality if people can't, you know, come to church for a longer period of time. And this food, uh, is called Among Us of Caristo, the Eucharist, um, or of Caristia, which is the Greek word there, of which no one, uh, which means Thanksgiving, by the way, of which no one is allowed to partake, but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true, and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins, and unto regeneration, and who is so living as Christ has enjoined, right? So again, I mean, receiving the Eucharist means that we have been received into the church, right through baptism and, and chrismation, which goes with baptism. Um, and that we've been, right, regenerated, we're in the church, and that we are living the Christian life, right? And we believe the same things, right? All of these things are part of being there with the faithful, to receive all the communion. For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these things, but in manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation. So likewise, we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. For the apostles in the memoirs composed by them, which are called gospels, have thus delivered unto us what uh, was enjoined upon them, that Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks said, this do you remember to me and this is my body. And that after the same manner, having taken the cup and given thanks, he said, this is my blood and gave it to them alone, which the wicked devils have imitated in the mysteries of Mithras, commanding the same thing to be done. For the bread and cup of water are placed with certain incantations in the mystic rites of one who's being initiated you either know or can learn. So he's basically saying, you know, the demons copy what is true. He talks a lot about this, actually, other things about this too. Um, you know, some people lo- will try to extrapolate. They'll say, ah, well, this comes from paganism, right? But it doesn't come from paganism. It's that the demons and pagan religions really are copying uh, what we do. And and we afterwards continually remind each other of these things and the wealthy among us help the needy, right? This is also sacramental. This is also part of it. This get the giving that we do, and we always keep together. And for all things wherewith we are supplied, we bless the Maker of all through His Son Jesus Christ and through the Holy Ghost. And on this day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. And as long as time permits, then when the reader is ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Then we all rise together and pray. And as we before said, when our prayers are ended, bread and wine and water are brought. And the president in like manner offers prayers and thanksgiving according to his ability. And the people are sent saying, amen. And there's a distribution to each and a participation of that over which thanks have been given. And those who are absent, a portion is sent by the deacons. And they who are well-due and willing give what each thinks fit and what is collected is deposited with the president. Uh, who succors the orphans and the widows and those who through sickness or any other case are in want and those who are in bonds and strangers sojourning among us and in a word takes care of all who are in need. But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world and Jesus Christ, our Savior, on the same day rose from the dead for he was crucified on the day before that of Saturn, and on the day after that of Saturn, which is the day of the sun, having appeared to his apostles and disciples, he taught them these things, which he we have submitted to you also for your consideration. So, and interestingly, you know, we give Anditeron after the liturgy. Um, and Deuteron means not the gifts, right? The gifts are what we offer. Um, and and the rest of what we have. Uh, that loaf, and we, we have a bunch of other loaves too, because we have so many people, we cut that up, and the priest blesses it, and if you go to like a Russian church, they also offer you wine, so you get bread and wine after the, uh, there's usually like a common cup, and people drink the wine too afterwards, so anyway, um, we got through part of the liturgy, any questions about anything we talked about?
I've got a question, Father. Yes. That's okay. Yes. Um, so our partaking of the gifts, is that something that happens after we offer them, or is our partaking part of how we offer them? Well, yes. Right. Okay. I mean, I think our we partake. How do we partake in the offering? We partake in the giving of the offering, right? And there are several ways we do this, right? Some people, like I said, can actually mm -hmm. they will they will offer the loaf, right? That's one way of partaking in the offering. Uh, but just by being there, we are partaking in the offering, right? Because we are offering it, right? As 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 a body, we are offering as a community, we are offering it to God. So we partake in that way. And of course, we receive the benefits, right? We offer to God just bread and wine, and what does He give us? Himself, right? The medicine of mortality. So we partake in that. And and uh, you know, there are times that there are even among the faithful those who do not partake. Perhaps they haven't fasted, right, as they should. Um, and uh, I mean, if you work a night shift in a hospital, for example, you might have to be, you know, eating that night. Uh, you know, so there, there, there are different things. If people say they haven't fasted, they won't, especially if they're like liturgies a lot, like during the week. Um, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go, right? Because we still benefit uh, from when we were still could be part of that offering and we can still, um, you know, benefit from the, the hearing of the gospel. We still benefit from offering our prayers, right? And we're asking through our prayers for grace, right? I mean, and think about orthodoxy is that like we believe in in redundant grace, like God great gives grace in all kinds of different ways, right? And the, the Holy Eucharist is the, is the that's that's central, right, to the church. But there's so many uh, opportunities, right, for us to offer to God and, and God to offer to us. Thank you, Father. That helps. One one thing about the the East, right, is we we don't. We made distinctions between things, but we don't really divide things up, right? It's just like we don't say when the consecration, when like it actually happened, when changes actually happen. We just like, I mean, God knows, you know. <laughs> so that's that's good enough. God knows these things. So we, we really don't uh, go beyond what we do know. You know? All right. Any other, any other questions? I hope you find this edifying. I, I had hoped um, to read from the book of Revelation tonight to give us a sense of this heavenly worship. We talked about the Old Testament, but I didn't get a read from uh, the end of Revelation, which really gives us a sense of, of, of heavenly worship as well. And um, again, I mean, Revelation, it, give, it gives us the sense of the future, but it also uh, is part of our present reality. You know, they're, all, they're always antichrists, right? I mean, it, it is supposed that the, the Antichrist actually sort of spoken of in Revelation is Nero, Caesar Nero. But there, there, there are, uh, you know, everyone, all those that are opposed to Christ are Antichrist, right? And, and all those, those uh, behemoth uh, empires, right, that try to rule the world without reference to God are Babylon, right? So, uh, I, I won't go into this too much, but uh, but but it, you know it, it it gives us a sense of the past, the present, the future, like all these things, right? Because we worship the God outside of time, so we're we're we are uh, you know mystically uh, when we when we when we are celebrating, right? People are celebrating in Houston at the same time, and and celebrating like all over the world at different times, and 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 yet we're all receiving like one Christ, right? And he, each of us that partake only individually we we receive the whole christ how is this possible only in god right god can do whatever god wants to do yeah. so one thing that I, I may go over uh next week is the anaphora the liturgy of saint basil which just because it's it's awesome it's i mean it like just goes through salvation history it's absolutely amazing um and if we want to understand the really the 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 theology what what is the Eucharist about? What does it do for us? And, and well, first of all, we should start with what, what is the, the disposition I must have in order to make a pure offering and in order to receive the benefits, right? Um, if we want the grace of God to work within us, then we need to bring to him humility, right? 
uh, humility and obedience and repentance and forgiveness, right? It, I mean, it's like it's like being obese, and the doctor says, you know, you you need to eat right. I'm going to give you some medication to keep your cholesterol down, and you need to exercise every day, right? For for 30 minutes, and you might need to go see a trainer like once a week, and we just like pop the pills and don't do anything else. Right. I mean, the spiritual life is comprehensive. We have to do the whole thing. We are maximalists in orthodoxy. Right. We don't ask, like, what's the minimum I can believe and be a Christian? We want the whole thing, like the whole apostolic faith. And we want to live the whole life of therapy because it's given to us. It's not like if we do these things, God's happy with us. I mean, he's given it to us so that we can receive his grace. Right. And have his grace working within us. So the, we might go over that a little bit, pre-communion, post-communion prayers, because they, that's where our theology is. If you want to know what it, the disposition we need and how what it does, what what's the importance of Christian worship? What do we receive from Christian worship? Uh, especially the, the liturgy of the faithful, it's, it's, it's there. So we can do that. We might go over, there's some other passages, maybe some we've gone over that I want to go over again as we're talking this. And we, and we still have to go, uh, through the liturgy, like what we have, we have the lamb, it's still whole, it's not, it's still on the altar. We've done the prayers, but what do we do? Uh, what do we do now? Might go over some of that as well. Okay, we have like one minute left. Any more questions? Well, I sent a bunch of stuff out last week in an email and tried to answer a lot of the questions that I received in the chat. And I hope um, if you got to look over that email with like a lot of the resources, I hope you found that edifying. I sent out a link. One of the links was to the Transfiguration Liturgy. So if you want to see the liturgy, if you're not familiar with the liturgy, um, you know that that link will show you what I'm talking about. You can actually see it, or you can wait till we're done, and then you can watch it, whatever. Um, but if you, again, you can always email me if you have any questions about anything, and I'll try to email back or bring it up in class. But I hope you're being edified by this, and you're really... Um, learning at least at least right now the the kind of external um uh, things that we do concretely in worship how we externalize that which is within right and and we don't want to forget that we have to keep the the inner disposition is really what is important right and it's not like well this isn't important uh, only the inner disposition is important right um both of the, all of these things are important right it's like saying humility is important but but you know but like not being good, you know, to my spouse is okay, because, because, you know, I pray a lot, right? You can, we don't, everything has to go together, right? Everything has to go together. That's what we want to remember. All right. It's 816 and uh, God bless you. Have a good evening. Thank you, Father. You're welcome. God bless you all. Thank you, Father. Good night. Thank you. You're welcome.